Tuesday was quite a night. It was a real turn Texas blue kind of night, wasn't it? It looked that way. Yeah? Yeah, it looked that way. Uh, this is going to be an election uh, like very few in the fall. We have a slate of very conservative candidates, of which you are one. And the legislature is going to be, you might be a liberal in the Senate next time, actually, were you to go back to the Senate. I don't plan to be back in the Senate. I know you do not. Uh, but you might also get a lot, whole, whole lot of stuff done That's next right. time, right? That's by yeah, by no, comparison. I'm, I'm, you know, every legislative session, it's interesting, especially here in this town, that prior to every single session, the folks that get elected, there's almost that, that oh wheezy moment. You know, I'm, I'm panicking. What is the legislature going to be like? You just like? dropped a Jefferson's reference I, I did. here no, at the Austin Club. There's only you? like three people in who here got that it. Knew, knew who we're, those and were. We're two of them. That's yes, right. yeah. that, that's two, two or three of <laughs> yeah. them. But, but the fact is, is every legislative session, it functions, it works. Mm -hmm. And I think people obviously hear yourself, the media, likes to talk about a significant amount, and I think it's important. Well, we like drama. Yeah, that, uh, I've heard that. Yeah. I've heard that. But, but in the end, it's all going to, stuff will get I, done. I think it'll all work out. Right, and you, yeah. you will campaign with everybody on that slate. You think it'll be yeah, a unified I'm, I'm slate? Very, I'm glad that we have the primaries and the runoffs over with. I'm glad that we're moving forward to the fall elections, Good. and absolutely, 100% moving forward. Great. Let's get into the substance of the job that you seek, and, and what has really been the most controversial, that may be an overstatement, uh, uh, but, but the most controversial thing uh, from a policy standpoint that has come up so far in this race, and that is the question of your position on the property tax mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the sales tax. A lot of talk about this, mostly from your Democratic right, opponent, Mr. Right. Collier, who uh, has made an issue of a statement that you made to a Longview Tea Party meeting in January of this year. Here is the quote. And it's a partial quote I right. acknowledge, but I pulled out the relevant part. Quote, I don't like the property tax, never have. I think we should replace it. Mm -hmm. The best thing to replace it with is a consumption type tax, a sales tax right. per se. What is being said of you in, in uh, sort of the simplified version is that you want to get rid of the property tax, raise it, uh, and, and, and replace that with a, an increase in the sales tax. Is that a, an accurate characterization well, of your uh, position? An accurate characterization is I've said something similar to that quote ever since I really ran for office back in 2002. Right. That I firmly believe the property tax is very cumbersome. Yep. It's very troubling for homeowners, for business owners. It's unfair of how it's applied across the board. It's obviously the controller's office through the appraisal methods for school financing to make sure that each district is appraising at its appropriate level right. for school finance purposes. That's important. And training across the board. So there's, there's lack of consistency. It's difficult for property owners. And I firmly believe it, it is one of the more difficult taxes here in the state of Texas. And the fact is, I think it harms our economic development. But as we all know, and as I have said in numerous other conversations, and as you said, that's one tidbit that's so taken portion out. Of the quote. And I, I thought you were going to give the Nike reference just do it because I said that as well because the question is how do you get there right and, and and I've said over and over in other conversations that this is something that has to start in the House of Representatives it's the House of Representatives that creates a tax change and then ultimately to the Senate and ultimately so the comptroller doesn't necessarily have the ability to flip a switch on and off right but I do think it is my responsibility as the so-called chief financial officer for the state of Texas are running for that position to highlight issues that are very important and that are a drain, in my opinion, on potential businesses and economic growth here in the state of Texas. Whether or not it happens immediately, just do it, or over time, Correct. the reality is the criticism of it is the same, which is that if you get rid of the property tax, you severely limit the amount of revenue coming in the door for the state. There's concerns about whether we can uh, you know, honor the promises we've made to, to the citizens of the state, uh, meet our needs, pay our bills, and if you replace it with a sales tax particularly, you have the concern about disincentivizing businesses from locating But I think also if you you look or if you'd been in the Houston area where it's interesting one of my opponents has run TV commercials in Houston and everybody that I've run into who saw those TV commercials which in part is attacking me yeah. and at the end says I, I guess it's didn't say I'm for high property taxes because if you're not for a solution then you must be for the current system which is high property taxes for a lot of people and everybody that I've run into said well Glenn I thought it was your TV ad and I said, or, I said, I'm, I'm confused. I would prefer not to have as high property taxes too. So everybody that I've right. run into who have seen this discussion so far agreed that there is an issue and a problem. Well, and let's the fact is, is let, let's try to, let, so it's important for me to advocate 
water issues and water problems that yeah. are out there, and let's try to find solutions. But let, let's stipulate that there's a problem. Right. But let's stipulate right. that people right. don't like to pay property taxes. Peace. People I don't get, like to I pay any taxes. Okay. Period. Let's play that. But the consequence of the change that you're discussing is a consequence that you've not yet addressed. If you reduce the property tax, there may be perfectly good reasons. People, everybody in this room may want to see lower property taxes. But if you if you reduce the amount of revenue coming in the door, isn't that a problem? If you reduce, obviously there there is going to it's up for the legislature to ultimately decide. And you and I know this. Either one, you're going to reduce, period, or you're going to try to shift and change that. Ultimately, in the legislature sessions ago, we had a court case, as we're probably going to have another court case coming up this next legislative session, either before, during, or after dealing with school finance. And years ago, we were running up to a ceiling for a statewide property tax. Yeah. And there was legislation at that time to deal with that court case. And in the end, the legislature came up with a different method to resolve that problem and also to continue to fund schools. So you're saying then that the, the solution to this, if we were to reduce the property taxes, would be to either find the money through some other source Either of revenue. Either you're going to find it through through another or right. you're going to find it within. I mean, you're going, or you to, cut you're, or you you're cut going, you're going to tweak the system and change the system in order to continue to fund schools. I mean, the fact is, is here in the state of Texas, just like every state, we have to have infrastructure for our roads, we have to have infrastructure for our water systems, and we have to have infrastructure, which is our school systems. Right. We have to educate our children, and that's not just on the public school side, but that's also at the university, technical trades and associations. Right. We, those are things that we have to do. Right. And do we have an adequate amount of money in the budget now, absent a change? Do we have an I, adequate I amount of money we, now? I think we have an adequate amount of money in the budget Do you think today. we can stand to spend less? Well, I think part, it's prioritization, and how do we spend less? Last legislative session, if we want to talk about, say, for example, with public school systems, I carried legislation to try to give our school districts an opportunity to have more online education through the virtual school network. Yeah. Now that wasn't necessarily spending more money or less money, but it gave them an opportunity to provide education opportunities to kids that say, for example, in KDISD, where my children go to school, yeah. with such a big school district of over 60,000 people, they have all kinds of choices. But take one of my other school districts, which my average school district of the 70 that I represent in the state senate, I mean, they're, they're literally average a little over 1,000 people. They don't have those same opportunities. Yeah. But through technology and education, they can streamline and be able to, that child can have the same education as you can in Katy. And I think that's important. So is that more money? No. But it's a different method. It's no different than my third grader. I mean, she loves math. Right. But how does she love to work on math? It's not sitting with a piece of paper and a pencil like I did it. It was sitting on a computer, and she'll sit there for hours if we let her. Well, I hear, I so hear you've got to take advantage of these new opportunities. Is all my point. Well, so that okay. there's more to the question than just simply a dollar. Do sign. we have enough money or not? Yeah, there's, there's, there's more. more it's, it's more to it than that. Uh, what about the other half of that, which is well, if we're going to eliminate or severely reduce the property tax, we ought to replace it with some kind of an increase in the consumption tax. Mm -hmm. you, <laughs> your, your opponent has said specifically it will kill retail in the state. And he's not the only one. The business community, I've heard people in the business community express concern that if the sales tax were to go up significantly, we would actually see a huge impact right. and, and, on and, the business community. In the and state that's why this one opponent likes to go out and throw these outlandish numbers. You're that working you're hard not to say his name, I know that. Well, no, not really, because I've, I've got three opponents. So I have to give equal time to everybody. You do. So <laughs> you, you do, I don't. OK. So I, I, I try to be fair. I get it. Equal Fairn opportunity. Fairness. Yes. Equal opportunity. So, so you do not believe uh, uh, what he and others have suggested, that if we were to increase the sales tax, it would have a, a deleterious effect on the business community? It depends on whatever the legislature would come up with. If, if it was to the extreme of his examples, obviously that has Doubling an impact. Doubling the sales tax. Oh, quadrupling, five-folding, whatever outlandish number he's providing. Right. But the fact is, as we all know, that it's somewhere in between. I mean, that, that's political rhetoric is what that is. So you would be for, an, so you would be for some increase in the sales tax if it were married I, I, to a swap. I would definitely be for us changing the structure to reduce property taxes, but what does that ultimate form look like? I don't know. And the controller's office is one of the providers of information to make sure that people have information that they can make right decisions. It would ultimately be on the legislature to that, decide exactly that's what correct. that balance That's correct. Let me ask you about a couple of other aspects of reform of the tax system mm -hmm. since we're talking about that. So the margins tax mm -hmm. is something that you have had something to say about. In fact, you carried legislation in the last session correct. to provide some relief for businesses on the uh, under the uh, under the margins tax, uh, a lot of people said when the margins tax initially passed and then 
It did not produce the kind of results in the down economy that it was expected right. to. We need to get rid of this thing. We need to scrap it. Mm -hmm. Economy's better now. Correct. So uh, should the perspective of the state with regard to the margin tax be different than it was just a couple years ago when everybody was saying, throw it over to the side of the boat? Should we just leave it alone? Does it need more tweaks? Obviously, as I said, you, you introduced one mm -hmm. a, a change uh, a, a last session. What should we do about the margins tax going forward? Well, I think ideally a lot of different business owners would love to have it thrown out the door completely. But the question is, is, are, is the legislature in the next legislative session either forced because of school finance or for some other reason, whether it's the great econ the economy that we have right now and dollars that are coming in, mostly because of oil and gas and other, reven other revenues of sales tax increase, automobile sales tax increases, and other, other taxes that are bringing in more revenue than the last estimate, the, by the certification estimated. The fact is, is which one of those does the legislature want to hone in on? Right. And, and I think that's, that's obviously a difficult question to answer in part because you have a new governor, you will have undoubtedly a new lieutenant governor, and you have a whole host of new members in both the House and the Senate. And so ultimately, what are those competing ideas and what do they filter down to? But to the margins tax, we made some changes last session to where we gave everybody Across the board tax cut, which I thought was extremely important, but we also went in and took a very uh, narrow rifle approach to try to fix certain industries. Aspects of it, right? Very aspects that, yeah. that were very problematic if you and I were competitors, but because of one, one fact of your business and mine, you got a better rate than I did. And yeah. there's an unfairness in that. Right. The controller's office, obviously, you, your core functions besides the treasury, the revenue estimating, and the fact that you're dealing with the taxes and tax collection and tax policy, a lot of the margins tax is interpreted by the controller's, by the controller's office. office. And, and what is that balance? And right. so whether it's in the legislature or the next Texas controller, that person has to focus primarily a lot of attention on what is the fairness in this tax. Right, so since, since you say correctly that the comptroller has a, a, a disproportionately large role mm -hmm. in how this is administered, uh, tip your hand. Tell us if you're now Comptroller Hager, what, what, what is your position on how this should be implemented or, or, or administered? Well, one, I want to make sure that that office is very customer service. We have to make sure that as our field offices and our auditors are going around the state of Texas, we have the training across the board that everybody's applying an apple to an apple. And then when it comes to the margins tax in particular, I mean, my role is to enforce what the legislature has put forward. Right. But it's also to make sure that there is fairness. Yeah. And if people have a contested case and through a hearing process, they have actual opportunities at each level of the process yep. and it's not my role to necessarily try to go out and find more revenue for the state of Texas but it's also to make sure that nobody skates and gets away either right you have to have an even hand and everybody gets treated fairly. collect what you should collect but don't it be, don't be treated fairly right okay and I think everybody would agree with that uh, what about the question of, uh, of incentives uh, for, for mm -hmm. economic development purposes or exemptions mm -hmm. that might be offered to uh, to, to, to industry or to, to individual uh, corporations. W w what about that? That's obviously come up over time. You right. know, in some ways, the cheapest money we, 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 we can go uh, get for the state of Texas is money that already exists. Right. It's just basically right. eliminate unnecessary exemptions right. or stop giving away money to industries that say may not actually uh, need it in the form of incentives. What, what about that? Yeah, I've said Often several. called corporate welfare. Right, right, or however, however you want to call it, right. depending on which it, whether an ex exemption or a tax break, however be it, temporary, permanently, there's all kinds of different plans right. here at the federal level and everywhere else. In, in my opinion, I've always said consistently that I would prefer that we have no incentives, no special projects whatsoever, because obviously it's much easier to administer. Yeah. It seems fair across the board, yeah. but then once you start looking at if we're going to have them, and in the 21st century, other states have them, other countries have them. We deal with this on a federal level right. within in my, one of my industries in agriculture where trade, trade issues with other countries. Yeah. We're hindered by what we can sell because they're used as tools of politics, unfortunately. So I come from that vantage point of seeing the unfairness at times. It would be best if we had none. Yeah. But the fact is, is there are tools that are there, and so my position is if we have them, they have to be in a return on investment for the taxpayer.
De because defi it's, it, define what that means exactly. That actually it brings in, there is more money that comes into either the state treasury, the local treasuries as a result of this than actually we lose. So, you so if, you're giving, if you're giving away the cup right. and you get no cup in return, that's Some, pretty much a loss. Something's wrong. So you would prefer to disarm, but effectively this is an arms race, and if there's an arms race, right. we have no choice but to participate. We're, we have to participate, but we have to participate intelligently, right. and we have to participate where you provide the facts, the numbers, the legislature has, the appropriate information to make right. the right decisions, and if you see that there's problems, you say that there's problems. Would you do anything differently than the current occupant of the job is doing on this? I mean, you know, the, the current occupant has been criticized on a number of fronts. We'll get there. Mm -hmm. I, I, had, since, I, had, I had no doubt that especially you had Especially since you she's not to here, to. I feel more emboldened to talk about her. Yeah, but, but, as, uh, but, but you forgot your streamlining live. Well, she's probably watching it, right? Um, but, but, uh, but the Major Events Trust Fund is one example mm -hmm. of, a, of an incentive situation that is often criticized. Right. Why are we spending millions of dollars to get the Super Bowl here? Right. If they want to come, there's many reasons for them to come. They don't need right. this money. Right. Would you administer that or any other of the portfolio of incentives or exemptions differently than the current occupant? Well, for, first I will say that I have said numerous times, and I want to look at every aspect of this office because, one, there are numerous functions in the controller's office that has nothing to do with, per se, the constitutional responsibilities, which are obviously the treasury, the tax collection, and then also the revenue estimating. There's a tremendous amount of other things the legislature has given the controller over the years. Right. And so this is one of them, and your responsibility is to administer it. I think one thing that we could have done a little bit different of the issues that, that you mentioned too is as you see problems, readily tell the legislature and the public there's a problem over here and, and we need to fix it. You need to fix it because the controller didn't have the power in some of those to make the changes. What specifically you have to specifically what, go What specifically well, one, are you talking about? I, I don't think that in my personal opinion we don't need to be putting big screen TVs in sporting events. I don't, I don't see how that's a return on bringing more people here. Right. In other words, you talk about the Super Bowl, the Super Bowl is going to be only one place. And so therefore, you have to look at the question, are we going to have it? If we're going to have it, then it has to make sure that we bring in more taxes because of people visiting here that they would have went somewhere else. Right. But at the same time, I don't think we need to be putting big screen TVs and changing the carpet and all these things in sporting events, whereby that's not bringing new events here. I mean, yeah. that, that is a readily clear, definitive black and white issue, in my yeah. opinion. This this gets into another question, and that is whether you believe businesses in the state of Texas pay their fair share. That's a phrase that we hear. It's really, right. it's almost an empty phrase at this point. Right. But you know that at the center of it, 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 it means something. Do you think businesses pay the proper amount of taxes given the business community, the, the, the business climate here, the success they have? I think you also have to peel that back a little bit more, yeah. in all fairness, not, yeah. to, not to try to make it more complicated, but the fact is then you start looking down at different industries mm -hmm. and which industries. And then of that being said, maybe a whole sector of industries, but you talk about incentives and programs. Does one of them know to be able to go get some program where another one doesn't know to go get a program, so therefore there's a competitive yeah. advantage? I mean, there, there's all these complexities in it. I do believe that people pay a lot in taxes, whether it's local taxes, state taxes, right. and federal taxes. I firmly believe that businesses pay their fair share. So I, you believe, I believe in, in, that individuals pay their fair share. Right. But I also believe that there are inequities out there. Flashback to last session with House Bill 500 that myself and Representative Hildebrand carried where we gave the across the board and we tried to right. fix some of those inequities. Yeah. And so therefore, I do believe most people are, are overtaxed, mm -hmm. I, I, whether it's in business or individuals. I firmly believe that. Uh, one aspect of this, since you brought up something from the last session I wanted to ask you about, mm -hmm. was SB 1342. This was a mm -hmm. bill that would have addressed the question of whether some businesses are getting uh, uh, lower appraisals okay, than yes. they ought to. Uh, again, your opponent, who shall not be named, literally like Voldemort, you know, we're not, he, who shall not be named, uh, has accused you of deliberately killing this bill, basically uh, genuflecting before business by uh, hearing the bill in committee, but basically then just killing it. This would have addressed one aspect of this, which is whether business is paying its fair share in terms of depending on. Uh, terms I, of I think I know which one you're talking yeah. about. There was obviously just to kind of flash back last session, leadership decided myself and Senator Williams, who was chairing finance, that we need to do something a little bit different in finance. 
In other words, instead of having the finance bill go through Senate finance and then at the end of session have no time whatsoever to hear all the fiscal matter bills, right. they, all, they all essentially came and died. No one ever hardly got a hearing because there was no time to deal with them because you had to focus on the budget. Yep. So we broke out and had a subcommittee to where we could actually have a fair hearing on, these, on pieces of legislation. There were pieces of legislation that we heard in that subcommittee that had been issues that had either never been brought up before or they had been brought up over and over again but never got a hearing. And so some of them we passed out. I think we actually had more fixes to fiscal matter issues than we have in prior legislation history. So therefore, we fixed a lot of issues. This right. one in particular, if I remember correctly, I, we gave a hearing to it. I don't think there was a House companion. I'd have to go back and look. Yeah, I think, but, I think but, but, uh, Representative Turner, I okay, think. Okay, did it? Okay, okay. I just it is, it's been a little bit ago in a lot of pieces of legislation. But the fact is, is there is an issue out there I firmly believe we need to try to find a fix to it. What I did not want to do is piecemeal a fix. Because yep. if looking at it, if I remember correctly, it had a certain threshold and above, and I forget if it was a million, two million, five million, but properties that were a certain level and above, we're going to change the method. So now you bifurcate two methods, one for properties of this value and one for properties of this value. And my point is, is let's have a hearing, let's flush out some issues, and let's see if we can come back and, yeah. and have a committee substitute. And that's what we do on numerous pieces of legislation, so but we never got there. Appraisal reform is something that you're Absolutely. open to, it just, we, in yes. this context, it just didn't actually. And, and I've, I've carried legislation to deal with appraisal reforms over time. Okay. Let's let, mention the comptroller, the current mm -hmm. occupant mm -hmm. of the job. Let's, let's actually get to the, the question of her uh, performance and the office that she's run it. Are you generally satisfied with the job that Susan Combs I, did? I think Susan has served the state very well. I think she is someone that wakes up and goes to work before most of the people get there. She's uh, very passionate and dedicated to serving Texans. Obviously, you know, whether it's revenue estimates, you talked about the some of the different funds with the special events trust fund, a couple of things that she's gotten yeah. hit on over the years. Obviously, with the revenue estimate side, it is very difficult, and I think this is for every controller, if you go right. back through time, to try to give an estimate starting in January for a budget that starts nine months later and goes for two years. For two years. You wouldn't run I mean, your that own business that no, way. No, I, right. I, I don't run my own household that way. Right. And so that is difficult. But I will say this. When I walked in this room earlier today, everybody looked casual. They looked calm. They didn't look nervous. And you know why? Because we're not in legislative session. <laughs> if we were in legislative session, I guarantee you there's not a lady that wouldn't be holding their purse and a guy that wouldn't have his hand on his billfold because they'd be worried about what we do. So all I'm saying is, is that we don't need to go to a every single year session right. just so we can do a better job on revenue estimate. But I will say this, Susan has done a very good job, in my opinion, on transparency issues. Right. I think she's and, and, and brought to light some significant issues that, that we have here in, te in Texas from a debt perspective that most people didn't appreciate or understand. I think that's very important. Obviously dealing with endangered species to highlighting the issue that we have. Obviously last session there was a big fight on whether to keep it there, move it away, right. and, and, and I Se said- Seems like an odd fit. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I was out down in Corpus Christi yesterday afternoon and had a group of folks around that we were visiting with and they said, well, what are some of the other things the controller does? And I mentioned endangered species, and I went through a list of other things, and a guy next to me, he said, wait, can we come back to that endangered species? What does that have to do with tax collection, accounting, and revenue estimates? And so, well, the fact is, is if you shut down the entire Permian Basin, you shut down the ship channel, you shut down our rivers, it kind of impacts the economy, doesn't it? I hadn't thought about it like that. And, and in today's world, we have a significant number of endangered species here in Texas, and what can it deal with? So whether it should be there or somewhere else. You think she's handled that? You think she's handled it? Well, I think that obviously there's been some rough bumps, but I think the fact is, is highlighting the issue that it's a real impact potentially to the state economy. I think that's important. I want to understand the differences that you would imagine between Comptroller Hager and Comptroller mm -hmm. Combs. It is said mm -hmm. by your critics, people who don't want to see you in this job, this is going to be the third term for Susan Combs effectively. The first Hager term would be the third Combs term. Well, even though I've always wanted to be over six foot tall. It's not happening. I'm not. Yeah. I can and, assure and, you that's and, not happening. And, and I can tell you that 
numerous times when we've been around each other, for a few times she'd introduce me and she said, well, you know, Glenn's gonna do a good job of filling my shoes. And it took about the third time, finally, that Susan realized that I always said, I'm not wearing those heels. Right. <laughs> You're not gonna see me showing up at the building in heels. So, but to answer your question, what, what am I gonna do different? Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna still get there early in the morning. I'm an early riser too. The fact is, is I think that I have an ability to continually look at issues. And the fact is, is if we deal with some issues that we have, I believe, in trying to make sure whether we have a better customer service with our tax side of that, that operation, the revenue side of the operation, we need to make sure that from the revenue estimate folks that they have better training that they have better knowledge. So are you dissatisfied to, with what your, the list that you're giving? Well, I, are you dissatisfied I, with the, the way it's being done currently? I think there's rooms for improvements. Right. I mean, it's no different than whether it's your job or my job. If someone came and filled your shoes, not necessarily those shoes, but to right. come and sit in your place, they're going to do things a little bit different. Right. And, and I mean, I think you would have to admit they might could find some better ways. Sure. And so a new set of eyes is a good thing, right. and I think we all have a shelf life in right. a certain position. But generally, you're happy with the job. That she's I think done. overall, she's right. done a very good job. But I think there are definitely things that we can improve in this office, and that's why I'm excited right. to be running to be the next well, controller. You, you mentioned the revenue estimate. Let me go go back yeah. there. You know, we we missed. The, I, mean, I understand. You know, it's not her responsibility. The process in place well, was. It, it, it's the process. Whoever's that's in that position, been. it is your responsibility to get the number right. Right. Well, she it is she, regardless know, of the two years and nine months out. She, what she missed by more than eight billion dollars. It's not a rounding error. And no. the fact is, I've had a lot of people sit up here over the last couple of years who said, if we knew back then what we knew two years out, we would not have made a lot of very difficult decisions in that 2011 session. I had a chairman of finance, Mr. Williams, chairman of appropriations on the House side, Mr. Pitt said to me, if we had known what the revenue was accurately two correct. years prior, we wouldn't have cut public education to the degree that we did. Well, you had a lot of people tell you that if we had accurate information, the world would be different. I, I can tell you, as a member of the legislature, the 2011 session was a very miserable time. It was a rough time. It was a very rough time sure. dealing with the budget and the finances. And so therefore, absolutely. Wouldn't you have preferred we, to have an accurate we, number? Of course, as a member of the Senate Finance, I want an accurate number. And I think that it's important that as you see numbers changing, yeah. one, you tell the public. Number one, we have to take that agency in that particular area, revenue estimating, and we have to look at the models that they use, because those of you that may not know, we use economic modeling. Yeah. And then we try to tweak that modeling to adjust it to Texas. And Texas right now is doing very well economically compared to the other right. states. So we have to do a lot of tweaking is my point. We have a lot of different industries that are coming to Texas that have not been here today and have not, have not been here in the last decade. And we have to focus on those. We have to in particularly focus on the oil and gas side of it because that has changed everything So that's in Texas. how you avoid a repeat of what we saw. Well, I think that, that by paying very specific attention to make sure that your folks are getting trained right. to the level that they need to be, that there's cross training with, with other folks do revenue estimating in states. Did you know that there's like a revenue estimating conference every year? Right. We hardly send anybody to it. And, and I don't think going to conferences solves everything, but my point is, is you understand what are trends and issues, and that is very important. But as the controller, you have to make sure that you're asking every single t couple of months, six months, what are the numbers, what are we at today, and if you see the things changing, yes, the legislature has already left, but good, bad, or indifferent, you don't come back around, same as back in 2003 when I first got in the legislative session. I won my Republican runoff in April, and I remember back then, I remember like it was yesterday, that we were told that revenues were gonna be flat for the 03 session in 02. And then bar, somewhere probably around, I don't remember exactly, October, no, sorry, it's not zero, it's not flat, it's a $5 billion hole. Wow, then we got into session, Boom, January, nope, number changed again, it's 10 billion. Right. But it's better to have that information than not. Uh, yes, but right. it'd be better to have the information and not, one, have, if you see a trend line coming, you need to be much more ahead of so it. So your commitment then, if you win this office, is to be much more in regular communication with Correct. the legislature as these things change. And to make sure right. that we completely reevaluate how we do the revenue <laughs> estimating in that, in that division, right. to make sure that the tools, the equipment that the staff has, that we're paying the attention to it. Because, right. you know, if we have have, say, $6 billion revenue estimating number that's off. $6 billion is a lot of money. Yeah. I can't even begin to imagine not as, $6 not billion. As much as 8 billion. 
Not as much as eight billion. Right. But what is that in comparison to the overall budget for two years? Yeah. Well, three I and five percent. But three and five percent, when you're dealing with that amount of money and you're dealing with public education and higher well, education, huge. those are very real issues. Whether you're dealing with criminal justice and whether we make sure that we have drug drug diversion programs or other programs, when you cut those, then we then programs that are working, we need to make sure that we focus on them and don't have higher costs for taxpayers later. I need to press you on what you said earlier. You know, well, this is the process. We, we know it's every two years and you know, mm -hmm. we're not going to bring the session back in, in the even number of years to relook at it. Why not? That's this a, is the 12th or 13th largest economy in the world. Mm -hmm. And you, as you acknowledge, you would not run your business. I would not run my business. Nobody in this room would run their business predicting two years out what the situation is going to be. Why not look at doing some kind of a midpoint? Well, you, you can you can ask uh, the next governor that question. I'd love or, to have or, a or either we'll uh, we'll have a constitutional amendment. I mean, the fact you, is, you, you is would not that be for some kind of re I, I revision do. of that process. If there is a, obviously if there is a significant number difference and the governor wants to call us back in the legislative session to address it, same as we've been in for school finance right. or other issues, but I do not think in any right. shape, form, or fashion that we need to be a state that comes in every legislative session every two years, every single year. This controller was popped after a, uh, an unintended breach of mm -hmm. uh, security of, uh, of information. Millions of Texans had their personal information. Yeah, I was one of them. And you were one of them. Yeah, so, could, you could you imagine when I got the mail that one day? and opened the envelope and we were about to drive home and I thought, well, this is weird. What is this? And opened it up and it was a real good thing that my three kids were in the back seat because I didn't say what I was on my mind. Yeah, that's uh, right. Because I didn't want them to learn those words. No, I get it. So I was one so of So you understand how a happy. lot of people in the state of Texas felt. Are you satisfied that the data security problem in the Comptroller's office has been fixed? I believe that it has been fixed today. How do you, how do you know that it's been fixed? I, there's there's no 100% certainty on anything. Wow. It's no it's no different than uh, my wife going to you know she she goes to Target and how many look what happens, how, look what happens there and so I, I all I'm getting at is this is that data security in the 21st century is a very real issue not just for government but for private industry. Yeah. And the fact is, is those that want to go and steal money to get acquired to data, information they can sell, or money, it's a lot cheaper and easier, not easier, they, they have to be right. really smart people, to go in over the computer system and, and to walk it. in the front door. Do you think the people of Texas would be satisfied to hear that the person who wants to be and is likely to be the next comptroller is essentially shrugging at the at the realities no, of the nobody, no, world? No, 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 nobody's shrugging at it. What I, my point is, is I'm bringing the fact that it exists. Well, and so that. therefore, you have to make sure that you are working as hard as you can and you're using the best technology capable to eliminate that potential threat. So what do you do when you go in day one? What do you day, do in day terms of one? Day one, you evaluate everything that you have yeah. and you look at other people and other businesses and other states that have high security information and issues and you make sure that you are performing at their same level. So best and practices. And if you're not performing yeah. at the best practices and right. above best practices, best practices is not good enough. Yeah. It has to be higher. Right. And so that's that would be a focus that is, of your time. That is, of course, it would right. be. Right. You, you've been you mentioned transparency when you came into. The the legislature, one of the early things you did was get on the transparency mm -hmm. uh, uh, mm -hmm. train. Uh, is the state of Texas now adequately transparent about the way it does business? I think we can always improve, but the fact is, is we have improved our transparency significantly. Right. This has been a big issue for the since, control, since the current two, Correct. Since 2007, but I think in part of that, it's no different that if you go to the controller's websites, they're very useful information. I mean, yeah. it, 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 the controller's office has an inordinate amount of information that's available right. for taxpayers, businesses, individuals, transparency information, but I also think that instead of having a whole bunch of different websites, we need to have under one umbrella. So that's one thing so, you would do, is exactly, you would aggregate exactly. everything under one. Yeah. And to make sure that right. it's continually refining how easy the information is accessible. And so my point is, is yeah. what you're saying in the question, are we transparent enough? Can people find the information? Right. Let me ask you about politics as it relates to the uh, Comptroller's Office and then as it relates to the fall election. Mm -hmm. One concern that is often raised about the Comptroller position is, I've said this here with other candidates right. a, a couple of times, it's a little bit like a mob accountant where the person who keeps the books is doing it essentially at the direction and orders and at the pleasure of the people in the organization 
above him. Now, as the comptroller, you work for the people of the state of Texas. Correct. You wouldn't work for, should they be elected necessarily, Greg Abbott or Dan Patrick. Correct. You work for us. Correct. At the same time, there were always downward political pressures for the comptroller to cook the books. Uh, specifically, your uh, opponent, who shall not be named, okay. uh, recently Is that in number a, one, two, or three? Number one. Okay. In a fundraising email, <clears throat> Uh, said the comptroller's office is a place for a financial expert. He has an accounting background, uh, touts that a lot. Not a politician who will cook the books to serve their own ambitions. He might have extended that to say, or to serve the ambitions of the people alongside whom he serves. So how do you say no to the people above you? How do you keep politics out of the administration the, of that office? The numbers are the numbers. And you don't try to adjust Every the numbers. Every controller has, has said that for well, a long time, I, and yet that hasn't been the case. Well, then you haven't seen Glenn Hager yet, have you? So your, your commitment to everybody here and elsewhere is no politics in the office. I'm going to run this office completely independent of any considerations above me or any political it, it, considerations. It, it's no different than in business. The fact is, is in my opinion, or in, in the house, individual household, right. the numbers that you have speak for themselves. And if this is the amount of money and the revenue that we have coming in the state of Texas, this is it. So going into but an election year when somebody says we want to be able to tout the health of the Texas economy. We're going into a presidential election year. We want to be able to show that for the last X number of years, the state of Texas has been healthy economically. We don't want a crappy revenue report, revenue estimate, because that's going to cast a bad light the, the, on the, what's the, come the, before. The, the problem is, if you kick the can to a bad economy, right. it's just going to make it worse. Right. Because people are making real decisions for their families, for their businesses. It's not just state government. Right. It goes down to the people that are doing so the totally hard work totally independent of all those considerations. It has to be right. independent right. of all those considerations. And at least in the legislative process, as I've been in the legislature, or whether it's in business, I've always been consistent that the numbers are the numbers or whatever the facts are the facts. And I'm not going to readjust things just because somebody higher up wants it to. What do you do about contributors to the comptroller's, uh, to, to your, to your mm -hmm. uh, political uh, uh, life, to your candidacy or your campaign? Uh, it is are, often, you want, are you wanting to be a contributor? Personally, I do not make contributions. You, you, www.glennhager.com. You, you were soliciting people earlier for being members of the trib. I thought for, I'd get that opportunity as well. And now my nonprofit status. I thought is we were being equal, uh, opportunity. equal opportunity. Yeah, yeah, equal uh, opportunity. You know that there's been a discussion for some time about whether there should be uh, contributions from mm -hmm. entities that have cases mm -hmm. before the comptroller's office. Right. It's a little bit like on the judicial side: should lawyers who have cases before the bench be making political contributions right. to judges? Or should energy companies be contributing to, say, railroad commissioners who right. are then regulating those very same right. uh, energy companies and those industries? Uh, you, have, you see any problem with taking money from people, some of them may be in this room, in fact, who yeah, have that, business before the comptroller's office? I think the fact is, and, and this kind of been the way I've, I've looked at it, is people that want to make political contributions, I greatly appreciate. Right. People that want to put a yard sign in their yard, I really appreciate. They want to put that little Glenn Hager bumper sticker on the back of their car. I really appreciate that. I really appreciate their vote, and I appreciate right. their support. Volunteers, people that will come make phone calls. And so all I'm getting at is that the only things that show up on a personal finance statement or a, a campaign report is the fact of who gave a political contribution. Right. It doesn't show up all the other things. But you know, and, and you will know, and your office will know, if people who have given money to you as a candidate or a campaigner have business before the office, have active cases. Will you pledge not to do business with, con with, with contributors, or should you pledge? I'm, I'm going to pledge that the same as during my time in the legislature, that I'm going to call things for the way they are. Right. I'm not going to give preference to any one person because either they put a yard sign in there, your heart, right. or whether they got a little bumper sticker with Glenn Hager, or whether it's a finance contribution right. of certain amounts. That, that's not how I on, play. On the merits, you're prepared to punch contributors in the nose, as it were. If the facts call it that way, absolutely. Okay. Uh, what's wrong with, I'm going to now name him, Mike Collier, your Democratic opponent, other than the fact that he's a Democrat, which these days may be just plenty. <laughs> what's wrong with him? He, you know, he voted for Mitt Romney. He, you know, he, he touts himself as what we would have recognized in old days as a conservative Democrat. He's not, he's hardly a tax and spend liberal by the standards of some campaign rhetoric. What's wrong with him beyond the fact that he has a D next to his name? We'll let the voters decide. Do you have any? Well, can, can you identify any material differences between his 
I'm sure you haven't spent a whole lot of time up late at night paying attention to his campaign's website, but can you talk about any differences for people who may be on the fence between the two? I, I think we'll get to all that at some shape, form, form and passion in this campaign, as well as the two other opponents. I've, I've met him one time. I haven't met the other two opponents yet. Yeah. Seems like a pretty nice guy. Right. Obviously has a resume that's been working in business, seemed fairly intelligent, you know, somebody that's, that's a, a very capable business person. But I do think that on the flip side, you know, some of the, some of the spaghetti on the wall and, and the attacks, well, that's really politics. You know, it's yep. interesting to me, it says, well, I'm going to take the politics out of the office. But the only thing that he does typically is sit behind the desk and lob political attacks. Right. I thought that was kind of political. You know, the first rattle out of the box after I won the primary, we're going to go up on negative TV ads. That seems pretty political to me, Evan. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, all, it's, it's kind of the way business is done at this, I, uh, in, in election season. Well, yeah, but you didn't see me running any negative tax. So, you, so you're pledging I, I, You're I, pledging not to run any negative ads? Depends on how nasty they get. No, I mean, the fact is, up to today, when, when I've campaigned, I've always go out and talk about myself. Because I think what's wrong with politics is that people are sick and tired of everybody saying why to vote against somebody rather than why to vote for somebody. Well, you could just somebody. commit right now not to run any negative ads, just run a positive campaign. That's all, that's all I've done through this whole campaign so far. And that's your intention. And that, that is my intention every single day. He had I don't had wake up and say, here's why you vote against so-and-so. Against so-and-so. No, let me tell you about Glenn Hager, and then right. you can make up your mind. He's asked you to debate. So far, you have not publicly committed to debate him. Would you like to publicly commit today that you will like, debate him at some point? Let me say, I have no doubt there will probably be debates at some point I in time. I have no doubt that there will probably be. It doesn't well, give fact, me much yeah, confidence. Well, you know, here's the fact. I've been out traveling the state of Texas. Right. I've had numerous debates in this campaign. Sure. I've had numerous forums in this campaign. In the How primary. many have he had? How many has he had? He didn't have a primary opponent. Well, that, that's, that's lucky and convenient. And so, so the, therefore, but the question then is, will you debate we, your major party opponent in the fall, yes or if, no? If, if, we have absolute, if we have debates, I'm happy to attend. But what I'm not going to do is the day after I finish a primary, sure. start engaging in a debate the next day, and we still have runoff elections so let's, to go. Let's, because let's, the voters, I mean, I, I think y'all had, uh, you were talking about the numbers the other day in your trip cast about how many people turned out and actually voted in these elections, both the you know, very small. Very few. Right. So the fact is, is we had a little a political process. It needed to continue to play out. Right. And I've been traveling the state and will continue to. But I have no doubt we will go, are going to have debates. I've had debates in every single at, after, office after that Labor I've, Day. Right. or at some point in time. Right. Uh, let me ask you finally about your confidence in this race and mm -hmm. winning this race. So you're a Republican in a Republic as a Republican state, mm -hmm. certainly. Uh, the numbers are on your side. An asteroid would have to hit you, as we've said many times, probably. Should I move over? You should not move over. I'm not wishing that on you. If you're, you're confident that you're going to win this race. No, I, I, don't, I don't take anything for granted whatsoever. But you can do the I mean, you want to be comptroller. Surely you can do math. <laughs> I'm, and I'm also an Aggie, and people have uh, accused me of not being able to do math. I, I might. <coughs> You've heard those, but you wore maroon tie for me today. I and did, I appreciate in fact, that. Thank you very in your, much. In your, I appreciate so, that. So, so an Aggie comptroller, that's interesting. I had, well, John Sharp was an Aggie comptroller. Right. He did okay. He did good. Uh, but very good. Look, the reality is you're the favorite in this race, just given the political map of the state of Texas. I have a question about what you intend to do with regard to your Senate seat and the timing of it specifically. Mm -hmm. If you wait, until after your elected comptroller to resign your Senate seat. If I understand the way the law works, special election has to be called. It has to be called for a certain number of days out from that moment. Correct. Are you not giving your Senate district essentially the, the short shrift because they will not have somebody in that seat for a period of time into the legislative session? If you're confident in the outcome of this race, why you're, the, not you're, resign? The, you're the one that's been well, so but confident. Why, why not resign before <clears throat> November to give time for the governor to call a special so that your district is not left without a representative in the session come the day we gavel in? And, and obviously, uh, when I announced for this, I could have resigned office at that point. Right. I could have resigned the day after the primary election, even though we didn't know if I won or not for two weeks later. Right. Uh, obviously, Representative Hildebrand, which I still appreciate to this day, made that, made that phone call. I still appreciate that yet to this day very much so. My wife does too, by the way. I'm sure it's but, a, lot, uh, a lot cheaper. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. But, but the fact is, is... You understand my question. No, right? I understand. And what I do not want to have is have that seat been, be vacant partway through session. I mean, it and, would, and, it and would that, be. You acknowledge it would be. It, 
it depends on when Even the time you have the, the election. Even if you quit the day after the election, you quit the day after the election, you'll have a period of time in which no one will be in that seat. Possibly. It depends on when the governor calls the election. It depends on how many people run for the seat. Are there 20 people that want to run? Is there two people? One, is there a runoff? Is there not a runoff? I mean, there's, there's so many hypotheticals. We don't really know. And, and I have thought about this quite a bit, but I also think that it's very presumptuous of me to assume that either I'm going to win a primary or a runoff or be able to win a fall election. Right. And the fact is, is whenever you're presumptuous, I think that... Comes back know, against you, right? Yeah. But and so you acknowledge that there may very well be a situation in which your Senate district there, goes without representation for a period of time that, that, in a session? Yes, yes. Unfortunately, yes. I, I do. Yes, okay. yes. Call Corster Fletcher. For what? For your Senate seat. Oh, there's a whole lot of other people running potentially too. Okay, tell me those people. Oh, there, there, I mean, there's so many folks that have either floated up and floated down during the process. Obviously, uh, earlier, just a minute ago, somebody was asking me about Representative Zerwas in that mix as well. Right. Representative Calligari in Are you going to stay out of it? I have no desire to be in that race whatsoever. I have no doubt. Okay. Uh, Chairman Hager, thank you very much. Good to have you yeah, here. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Take questions from the audience. <laughs> We have time for some questions from the audience. Surely there were a number of things you wish that we had asked that we did not, and I'll ask that you raise your hand. We'll walk the microphone around to you. My only request of everybody here is please no speeches, be respectful, ask a question so we can get to other questions as well. And if I cut you off, forgive me, but it's in the interest of, of all this. Sir. Uh, Candidate Hager, uh, yes, Susan Combs, the current control controller, endorsed you early on. Mm -hmm. She was subject to her criticisms, the budget estimate, the uh, data breach. She was also criticized for her quarter billion dollar award to Formula One, which was made even before the event had applied to the city of Austin, as the law requires. I happen to be the person that filed the taxpayer lawsuit to prevent okay. that payment. Question, please. The Major Events Trust Fund limits awards, uh, um, which are a pass-through of lodging and sales taxes and other taxes, limits those awards to the increase in taxes from the event. With little variation, Austin's lodging economy... Question, please. I'm sure. sorry. We'll use your example there, okay. Senator Hager. You yes, said sir. that you thought that we should only pay out in incentives what comes in your glass mm -hmm. to the recipient. Yep. The controller to Formula One basically gave four of Evans' glasses general revenue and poured it into Formula One's cup. Are you going to continue to make a four and five X payment to Formula One for? far in excess of the tax benefits they provide to the state of Texas. Well, the legislature last session made some... Am I on? Oh, yes, I am now. The legislature last session made some changes, obviously, you know, to, the, to some of the trust funds. And the fact is, is what I want to make sure, if we're going to administer the program, and I'm not necessarily saying today that the controller's office should be the one doing that. I mean, I want to evaluate everything that's in that office. And the question is, is should the controller be the right person if such a fund is going to exist, is it better served to be there or is it better served to be somewhere else? Th to th separate th it, out, th uh, to separate happens, it out, of the, out of the office. This happens from time to time. Functions of the office may be removed. And so would you, would you support the administration of the Special Events Trust Fund being moved out of the Comptroller's office and say back to the legislature? It, it's fine with me if it moves. The same thing as I brought up endangered species, whether it stays there. It was once at the GLO. <clears throat> Property tax division was not there originally, and it had been moved well, under shock. Well, in fact, the, the performance review function. The performance reviews As were, I understand it, you voted to have the performance review function back in the in, legislature. Back in, I'm trying to remember if that was 03 or 05. I'll say during one, the Strayhorn one, one the two, Yeah, one of the two times. So now that you're going back, to, you're now running for comfort. Would you like to see the legislature, by the way, on the performance review go back and give it back to the comfort? No, I've, I've said numerous times, and not that you've been in every place that I've given a speech at, but the fact is, is that I've said several times that if the legislature wants to move it over there, I'll perform the function. I don't necessarily, You're I'm, not, not, advocating I'm, for it. I'm not going around asking for it. Right. During my primary, uh, one of the, a couple of my points, if I remember correctly, were advocating to move it back. They were. And I said, I'm looking at the whole area of things that are at the controller's office and other things that we can move away. And the reason for that is because I think that I have to focus first and foremost on the constitutional functions of that office. So to the question of the Special Events Trust Fund, you're again not advocating that it be moved out, but if it no. were moved out, that'd be fine with you. Yeah, either Got way. It. Okay. Other question, gentlemen in the back and then Mr. Levant. Sir. Thanks, Senator Hagar. Um, one of the functions of the Comptroller's Office, which some could argue shouldn't be there or should be there, is the State Energy Conservation Office, which both 
reviews energy use of state agency right. and also does things like looks at uh, statewide building codes, either for state funded or for, for actual Correct. construction Correct. throughout right. the state. Right. Do you think the State Energy Conservation Office should be at the comptroller? And this, the secondary question would be, what changes, if any, would you like to see at the State Energy Conservation Office, assuming it does stay? Right, stay right. right. you know, you all do energy rebates. So you, you do yeah, a, lot, no, a lot of that stuff, right? That, that function was moved there years ago, as, as you know, Cyrus. And the fact is, is someone in the state of Texas has to hold that function in order to be able to draw down the federal dollars. It's mostly federal dollars is what it is. And so someone has that function to perform that responsibility and that duty. And again, much like trust fund, other issues that are there, whether it's better performed there or somewhere else. You can imagine that going somewhere else. Ab well, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> but the fact is, is if, if the function is there, then I'm going to pledge to do the best of our ability and make sure that we perform that responsibility to the highest level and the highest standard. You know, and there, there have been some issues, I know here not too long ago, with some legislation that changed in how we administer part of those dollars. And the fact is, rulemaking went out to who could apply for these types of funds. And the fact is, people weren't happy, so we did another rulemaking. And the only person that applied to it, well, then they withdrew their application because it, it became too bureaucratic. And the fact is, is I want to make sure that we don't have that happen. If we're going to perform it, we need to make sure that it performs at the highest level. But that's one of those functions that I could see being put somewhere else. Couldn't you argue that the portfolio of things that the comptroller is responsible for is so large that it's it huge. would actually benefit your ability to do the things that you should be doing well to offload a bunch of things that are really marginally related? Sounds like you've been listening to my campaign speech. So then you actually, but you sit here and say that you're not advocating for these things being moved, but the fact is you're advocating for something. No, I, I am, but the question is, is I'm trying to ascertain what are the best things that should be moved, and then obviously one, you have to have a willing place for it to go, and the legislature has to be willing to move it. So I am advocating that I think that that office needs to shrink in responsibilities, yeah. and in part to be able to focus more attention and more time on the revenue estimating, the treasury, right. and the tax collection, and how you core, administer core business. those. The core business, okay. absolutely. Mr. LeBach. Sir. Uh, thank you, Senator. I'm James LeBach. I have a question for you about state finance. Mm -hmm. I, I, I like the comment you made that people are not clutching at their wallets right now. Yes. One of the reasons is the state's doing fine. Yep. But the creeping shadow that's making its way toward the Capitol is the school finance lawsuit. We'll probably get a ruling from the trial court this summer. Right. And I don't know anybody who thinks the state is going to win at that level. But the Supreme Court will have the final say. What do you think the odds are the Supreme Court may rule before sine die of the regular session? Yeah, I think it's a high probability. Obviously, what is the court schedule? I haven't looked at recently. Are you as pessimistic as Mr. LeBas about the outcome of this case? Well, I think the outcome of this case is vastly different than what the first outcome was. And in part, last legislative session, as, as you said, I think maybe earlier, we put more money About in the About three and a half billion back, put, although, although Judge Dietz didn't seem of, to be that impressed by it. Well, I, don't, I think regardless of what number we put in, Judge Dietz wouldn't be impressed by it based on a normal, his rulings. Right. And so we closed some of the inequities between school districts, and obviously that had to restart the case all over again, yep. which, which is right. And I do think that there's a high probability that the court makes that ruling, and I think it would be good that the legislature could tackle it rather than coming back into a special session sometime between 2015 signing die and the next 2017 session. Now, Judge Dietz was talking back in the early part of this case that if sort of play out the string here, it could be that the state is on the hook for as much as $2,000 per enrolled public school student. You know, that math I can do, $10 billion annually, $20 billion over the biennium. That money is not going to be available to come from the existing budget without a tax bill, is right. it? You, you can't find that much money in the budgeting currently. No, and I, I, I would absolutely disagree with that $2,000 number. Yeah. I mean, I, I will disagree with that, you know, and I'll, I'll look at, uh, Claire Hager, my oldest daughter in third grade there in KDISD when we ended up doing the cuts in 2011. I don't know if you remember, but of all the school districts that I represent most around the state, there was like panic in Katy yep. because they went and fired about 400 teachers and assistants. And it was in the middle of legislative session. Now, of course, they were trying to make their decisions for the fall and they needed to make those decisions. But at the end, they ended up hiring all those folks back yep. and, and Claire, she got just as good an education this year as she did a year ago and a year before in a very good school district. So, are you so I don't I don't think adding two thousand dollars to public education across the board 
is any way to fix education. And the reason, same as I said earlier, yeah. you have to look at how do our kids learn today, and you can't treat one every kid as a kid. I yeah. mean, every, every, we're, all humans are different, the way we think, the way we process different. And that's one of the challenges that our public school system and our teachers have is that they are asked to treat every child as the same child. So you're and satisfied that our public them. school finance system currently is working well enough that in the absence of this lawsuit, we just go down the path as we have no, been I think, I, think, I think we always continue to try to close the inequities of the school districts that are out there. I mean, as you right. know, school finance, unfortunately, is very complicated because yep. it's the state guarantees a, a public education of adequate, equitable finance system. And then the fact is, is you have a mix of 1,040 school districts. Yep. And so that, that's a really hard marriage. And every single school district is different. They are not the same. Right. And then whether they're the one year compared to another year, did they have a lot of homes being built? Now they have challenges. Uh, the, at Clare School a year ago, half the kids were in portable buildings outside the elementary school. And I remember one of my neighbors complaining to me and said, I didn't move here so my kids can go to school in a portable building. I mean, he was livid. Now the next year school got built and half of them all moved out. So that, those are challenges, whether mineral interest in one school district, one year they're a chapter 42 and then their next year they're a chapter 41. Right. That literally can change just like that. And so all I'm getting at is that we have to continually tweak and change our school district and how we educate our kids. And so no, I think you know, whether it's testing, I mean we can get a whole, whole list of issues. So the fact is, is no, I'm not completely satisfied with what we have in the state of Texas. Other questions for Chairman Hager? Have we just worn you all down? <laughs> I am a member of the Senate. I did not talk a lot, as we've been accused. In, indeed. Okay, Once well, we let's, the mic. let us thank and acknowledge the Chairman for his time. Yes, thank you. Thank you all. We'll see you after the summer.